Um, let's talk to Robert Hardman now. He is a speaker at the Lewis Speaker Festival festival and he is a journalist documentary maker and author of the queen of our times as well robert um it's uh, wonderful to uh, have you on the program how are you peter nice to see you good evening it's a nice clear shot that's certainly how i see it uh, robert um i know that's the name of your your articles in the daily mail that i've been reading for years and years and years and years and uh, you're a wonderful writer who describes things beautifully i'm sure you've done the same thing in your book the queen of our times i know you have had a unique relationship with the royal family over the years as well tell us about this book because now of course we're looking back uh, on the queen and her extraordinary life and uh, i'm sure you've looked into so many things that are, are part of part of her life that perhaps we haven't considered before yeah, I, it's such an extraordinary life, Peter, that I, I think you've really got to stand back and look at it in its entirety. Uh, that here is someone who was born, uh, born actually within weeks of television being born, surprisingly enough, very first uh, uh, trial run of TV happened just the same time. And, and someone who was never um, born to be queen. She wasn't born to be monarch in the same way her father wasn't uh, born to be monarch and his father wasn't either. And yet, thanks to the abdication crisis, suddenly she's uh, cast into this role uh, and has become, frankly, the most uh, single, uh, outstanding uh, post-war head of state, really, um, on, on, on the planet. Uh, we saw that in uh, so many of the tributes that followed um, her death a few months ago. But, but uh, she was uh, she very kindly, when I was writing my book, um, she gave me access to her father's War diaries, something that have never been published, and they're absolutely fascinating um, because they're, they're they're very extensive. There's about eleven volumes of them, um, and they really take you through what was going through the mind of this man who'd only been king a few years, uh, and and suddenly uh, there he is having to lead his country through the greatest crisis of, of of all time, and and she's learning from him. She was devoted to her father, and I think when you understand a lot about him, you understand a lot about her. Um, and, and so whenever we look back at some of the crises of more recent times and people often say, well, well you know, what did she think about, you know, whether it was the Annus Horribilis or, mm. uh, uh, you know, Megxit or whatever, um, you've got to put these things in context and realise when you saw what she'd been through mm. and what her family had been through and how they'd handled it, um, I think it does go a long way to explain why she was this remarkably calm person and, and all the way through my book I kept trying to find out you know people would say well, what, 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 what new things did you find out about it well I found out a lot of new things but uh, one in particular is she never panicked she absolutely never rushed into anything you, you could occasionally point the finger and say well she should have acted sooner on x or y but she never she was never one for panic and I think it served her very well it's interesting you mention actually how we think of because obviously most the vast majority of people in this country are, are obviously younger than the queen and are, are people who are uh, looking at the last you know more contemporary times and we, we mentioned megs up there the anastar rebelist back in, in in the 1990s and so on. are we guilty kind of almost as a society but specifically in relation to the queen of only really evaluating what we know contemporaneously of a person rather than their whole life you talked about the the importance of seeing her whole life because when you think of something like the the Harry book recently, which was of course after the Queen died, but but even the, the elements there previously, I mean, they were just very small elements of such a long and rich life that had seen so much crisis, had seen a war, had seen the abdication and all the rest of it. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, I think we are just as, as human nature to, f to fixate and focus on whatever the drama of the present is. Uh, we in the media, certainly in the in the press, uh, we, we we are all guilty of that. I mean, you know, we we deal in today's news, uh, but um, but she could take the long view, and 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 she did. You know, when you when you've seen whether it's uh, the, the the crisis very early on in her reign of of, of Princess Margaret wanting to marry group Captain Peter Townsend, and then along came Suez, and then along came the sixties, and the monarchy suddenly f finds itself sort of left behind. Um, and there are big crises to do with the royal finances in the 70s and uh, the 80s all look wonderful, perhaps, with, with, with weddings and grandchildren. But the 90s were, were the nadir of her, mm. her reign, not just with, uh, you know, the Windsor Castle fire and the, and the, and the breakdown of all the marriages in, in 1992, what she called her Anna Cerebilis. Um, but, but, you know, year after year of pretty relentless, uh, harsh 
brutal sometimes um, headlines and coverage, and then the tragic death of Diana, and then and then even something as as, as supposedly uplifting as her golden jubilee. I mean, that's literally just started uh, when her sister, Princess Margaret, dies, followed um, just within a matter of weeks by her mother, the Queen Mother, and yet she she never missed a single engagement during her golden jubilee. You know, she was this remarkably. Uh, stoical, uh, devoted figure who just pressed on, you know, who who learned from her father that that, that every crisis is a, is a storm. And as, as I, I spoke to many world leaders when I was writing it, John Major made a very interesting point. He said she lived by the doctrine of this too shall pass. Yes, yes, indeed. That from her father, who was a who was a, a sailor, he'd been in the First World War in the Royal Navy, and and she was a brought up on that idea that you know this may be absolutely appalling today, but we will get through this, we will get over it, and we saw that. I suppose um, you know the the epitome of that was in the in the COVID pandemic. Yeah. Extraordinary that on we the eighth year anniversary. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. And that that was that was such an incredibly powerful message. And it was interesting because, as a uniting figure, as this kind of person who who was the glue of of Britain in many ways, as someone who gave that address during uh, COVID and the lockdowns and so on, saying we will meet again. I mean, it was just this very straightforward delivery, unshowy, very plain language in that regard. But actually, it touched so many people, and that, to me anyway, as someone who was a big fan of the Queen and had followed her throughout my life anyway, uh, that was something that was almost a fitting coda, actually, in terms of what she had tried to do throughout her life. Yeah, it, it was extraordinary when you think about it. That was 80 years on from her very first broadcast, when as a teenage girl she broadcast to the children of the Commonwealth um, during wartime. Um, and in many ways, it was she was doing the same thing, uh, you know. All those, you know, eighty years later, which was to say to people, "Look, I can't, I can't do miracles, but I, I'm here. I'm with you. We're all going through this, and and we we will get through this. Mm. You know, we're going to get over this, and 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 the sun will come out again. I mean, that was essentially what she was saying in 1940. Uh, as see, you know, with with uh, Princess Margaret at her mm. side, and you know, it was a very powerful speech then, and it, and there in the in the pandemic, and we forget. I mean, this was the the very dark days of the pandemic. Within literally within hours of her broadcast um, that that Sunday night back in April 2020 within within hours we had the news that the Prime Minister was on his way to intensive care yeah, people yeah, yeah. I mean you know the country was rudderless so mm. you know thank heavens we had the Queen yeah absolutely uh, Charles of course now the uh, King looking towards his coronation and so on wondering as many people are whether uh, Prince Harry will be actually coming to that clearly the monarchy is having a form of crisis I mean I saw in, in one of the newspapers I think it was the I news newspaper said it's the biggest crisis for 30 years. I didn't think it was at all, actually. I don't think it was as, as bad as, as Diana dying, for example. There are many other ways in which she could characterise that. But I wonder what lessons the Queen, and, and through your book, the sort of King Charles will have from his mother. Obviously, he, he knew her probably better than most people. But in terms of her example, do you think he's following that? Do you think he's trying to do his own thing in these early days as, as King? Or will he be a very, very different monarch, do you think, Robert? I, I think it'd be different because every monarch is different from 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 the previous one, and so it should be. No one should be sort of uh, constrained by a sort of a, there is no real rule book. I mean, there's, there's constitutional monarchy. There are conventions. That's it. Um, I mean, the Queen was uh, she, she adopted, and I write about this a bit in the book. She had a sort of what what what, what some people call a big tent uh, strategy. You know, it's a big tent. There's room for everyone. It explains why she was very forgiving. Um, people often wondered, you know, why was she so indulgent, perhaps, with her sister? And, and then latterly with Prince Andrew, who was another source of great scandal, and then with Harry. I mean, she, she was absolutely devoted to Harry to, to the end. I mean, of all the members of the family uh, who were keeping the lines of communication open with California after Mexico, I mean, the Queen was one who would, 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 was always happy to take yeah. his, his calls. And, and the real mother, who wasn't meant to be king, um, her, her sister, Margaret, was the spare. Andrew was the spare. So, you know, when it came, came to that, that, the Harry crisis, she, she could see, uh, the, you know, the, some of the, the problems he faced. Um, but I, I think, you know, her, her view was always let's let's try and sort of find a positive way through this. She was not confrontational. And I suspect, uh, I, I, I mean, I'm sure, uh, you know, Prince well, the, the King Charles is, is, is now, uh, you know, working out uh, how, how best to approach this. Uh, but I'm sure he won't be coming at it in a sort of right, um, you know, uh, Cold War kind of way. Yeah, he won't yeah, be yeah. sort of 
uh, saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to talk to Harry. I, I, I think, you know, the reconciliation is clearly in everyone's best interest. How long it takes and what form it takes, well, let's wait and see. Yeah. But I, I, I would say that it's at the moment it's sort of 50-50 that Harry will be at the coronation. I don't rule it out at okay. all. Okay, well, Robert, we will see and uh, perhaps we will talk to you again nearer the time. Thank you so much and very good luck with the uh, speech at Lewis and also the book in general. That's Robert Hardman there. He's a journalist, documentary maker and author of The Queen of Our Times. He